Hey everyone, Skarn here, and I am excited to bring this video to you all. I've recently replaced my Hotas this past week, and upon doing so, I sent my old Hotas, which had nothing wrong with it. Um, I specifically upgraded it for a buddy of mine in an attempt to get him into DCS with me. Uh, I've tried this in the past with him. It's just, I sent him a very cheap uh, joystick and throttle. The throttle that kind of twists is actually a, a Thrustmaster T16000 or whatever it is. Uh, definitely not enough buttons to learn an aircraft with. Um, so upon creating this video, it is mostly for him to try and ease the learning process of learning these complicated aircrafts. Especially when first starting out, it can be extremely overwhelming and daunting, especially if you're trying to learn it alone. Personally, when I learn things, I'm more of a visual person. I can read something over and over again and until I actually go over the process and do it time and time and time again. Uh, it doesn't really click for me until I do it. So, and making this video, I'm kind of hoping to shed some light and hopes of making the learning process a tad bit easier and less daunting. A lot of that process has to start with finding an aircraft that you're most passionate about. If you don't enjoy flying it, you're definitely not going to want to take the time to learn it. For me, that aircraft is the F-16C. I can't necessarily put into words why that is, but it just feels like home to me. It was the first aircraft that I took the time to learn. I like that it's a single seater. I like that it's very capable and air to air combat, but I especially love taking the fight to uh, enemy SAM systems. To me, there is no greater aircraft for that fight than the F-16. So for creating this video, I am hoping to show the basics, such as a quick startup of the aircraft from a cold start, uh, but it, it's just more going over the basics. It's not looking for errors and stuff like that, because I don't really, I don't, to me, this is more of a game than a sim. You know, it's, it's something I like doing. I love military aircraft, but having system faults and system failures and stuff like that that's just like i'm i'm not gonna be a pilot so this the simulation side of it is more of a game to me so i'm not gonna go over like all the faults and stuff like that of the systems but i'm gonna walk you through the process of getting it started uh especially from a from a cold start then i'm gonna walk you through the process of engaging in air-to-air -air combat with a lot of chatting about the dynamic launch zone also known as a dlz how it is similar between air-to-air -air weapons as well as air-to-ground uh ordnance yeah, or air to ground engagements. So dynamic launch zone, very similar between air to air and air to ground. Uh, then with topics covering some some of the air to ground weapons. So walking through, especially the harms, and then I think we'll go over like a laser guided bomb, how to drop those as well. So I hope you're able to take away some, some knowledge away from this video and to get some new people into this wonderful sim. Thank you for taking time out of your day to check out the video. And I hope to see you in the virtual skies. With that being said, let's get started. So the very th first thing we're gonna wanna do is come down here to the left side, just in front of the throttle, where it says main power. Let's go ahead and get that turned on. And then with the main power on, I'll come back here to the IFF panel, and I'll make sure that that knob gets turned from off to normal. We're gonna come back up here to the left side, where it says jet fuel, we're going to turn this down to start two. From there, we hear the engines start to kick on. And we also see that our RPM is rising. 15%. 20%. Once it gets to about 24, 25%, it'll kind of settle in place. Once that throttle is settled, or the RPM rather, once the RPM is settled at 24%, which right now it's at 24%, we're going to come back over here. We're going to look at our throttle, and we're going to need we're going to need to move our throttle into its idle position by holding right shift and clicking home, and then from there. We'll watch our RPM rise again. So it went from 24% to 45, 50, and it should settle somewhere around 69% or so. And with that, we'll see a lot of our caution lights are off. Canopy is on because our canopy is up. Our canopy is not closed yet. 
We'll also see that our MFDs are black as well as our data, but that's because we haven't haven't turned any of those on yet. We'll come up here, we'll turn our radio on. We'll go ahead and close our canopy with this latch here, or we can hold left control C. We'll go ahead and close our, our canopy latch. And then on the left side, threat warning auxiliary. Go ahead and turn the power on. And then up here, we want to turn our jammer on, as well as the RWR. And we want to flip up our chaff and flare. And then we'll want to go ahead and set our countermeasures to any mode that you desire. I typically run manual or semi. And then this one here is going to be our helmet mounted display. So we'll go ahead and turn that on because we'll have to align it once we get everything fired up. So once you're done with all this, we'll go ahead and continue up. We'll want to turn our HUD symbology on. So we'll turn that all the way up. We'll want to go ahead and get this uncaged. Right click, get our two white lines lined up. And then coming down here on the right side, we'll actually want to come back here to our avionics power. We'll want to go ahead and turn on our mids, our data link, GPS, MMC, MFD, UFC, and map. Down here is actually our INS alignment. So we've got two options. We can do right click once, which will put it into stored heading, or we can right click it twice to normal alignment. Normal alignment will take a little bit longer. I typically do stored alignment or stored heading. Once we flip that up, we'll see our DED as well as both of our MFDs are on. We'll see that the FCR is off because that is actually these four panels up here or these four switches up here. So the left HDPT, that's going to be the left hard point. So that'll be our harm targeting pod or our harm targeting system. So we'll go ahead and right click, turn that one up. Our right hard point, which is going to be like our targeting pod. FCR is our fire control radar. And then RDR altimeter, that's going to be our radar altimeter. So we want to get that turned on as well. And as soon as our INS alignment counts down to I believe it's 1.5 slash 10. We'll see our alignment, which I'm going to turn this down. We'll see our alignment will start to flash and it'll say ready. Our master caution is on because I haven't armed our ejection seat yet because we're inside a hardened uh, shelter. So ready is flashing, alignment is flashing, so we can go ahead and move this back onto navigation by right clicking twice. And with that being said, our F-16 is fired up and it's ready to go. All right, so now that we're up in the air, I'm going to kind of go ahead and show you how I get started. I guess the general rule of thumb for air to air engagements is the higher you are, the faster you are, the sooner you would be able to fire a missile. In order to fire a missile, you either need to be in air to air master mode or what I prefer is the missile override and the dogfight override. So the dogfight override is if you're within 10 miles of a bandit, you can cycle through different different sort of air combat uh, features by being in dogfight override mode and pressing display management switch up, for example, will put you in boresight mode. So essentially, if you get a bandit within the boresight here, it'll automatically lock the bandit as well as the triangle indicates where the seeker head is looking for 
the uh, heat seeking missile. So the AIM-9X in this case. By default, the AIM-9X, if you have them equipped, will be selected by default in close engagements. So in dogfight mode. Um, speaking of dogfight mode, especially looking at the right MFD, I like to have the right MFD uh, second page being the HSD page. So by default, it's not selected. So we'll go ahead and select it. Uh, HSD is the horizontal situational display. It's kind of the overview, the bird's eye view of our aircraft. So if there are any enemy SAM sites, they would show up on the HSD page as well as enemy fighters, assuming our AWAC sees them. So if we were to do display management switch up, like I said, is bore sight mode. Target management switch up puts us in bore sight mode. Target management switch down twice puts us in vertical scan mode. So basically our radar is essentially looking at this line here. And if we're able to put the bandit within that line, we will have them locked up. So those are basically the two that, that I use. Or once we get our helmet mounted display on, we could do target management switch up twice. And that'll put the big circle around our HUD. And then this way we can look at the target and hit target management switch up on that target. And it'll, it'll lock them for us. So that's a really, really helpful feature as well. So if we do missile override, that'll put us in more of the BVR engagement. So again, same thing, SMS page by default, no other pages. We'll want to have the second page be our HSD. So the HSD page is our best friend. So looking at our left MFD, We've got our fire control radar. We've got our asthma scan down here, which right now by default, it's scanning 60 degrees off of our nose. So the scanning zone works in a cone. So the closer we are, the less kind of area it sees compared to being further out. By default, we're A6 which is asthma 60 degrees. I typically run A3, which is 30 degrees. It'll give us a quicker return on any bandits that we might see. And then if you do your radar cursor switch, that'll allow you to move around. So you can still scan 60 degrees. It's just you got to point your radar to where you want to look. So here it's doing the left half. Here it's scanning the center. And then here it's scanning the right side. So the two vertical lines here with the 3, 9, and then 22, that is at that particular area, we're scanning angels 37 and then minimum angels 25. So you've got less room the further back you go or the closer you go. See, it's angels 30 and then 31. Whereas the further away we go, the bigger those numbers become. So if we look at our right MFD, we see that we actually have two bandits on our nose at our 12 o'clock. One at Angels 15, one five, so he's at Angels 15,000. And then the second bandit is at Angels 11, now up to 14. So what I'll do is I'll actually offset my nose. So making sure our master arm is on. And then if we were playing against other people, we would want to turn our master our external lights off all right so we see how they went from red to now a solid yellow square that indicates that our radar sees them and we can actually lock them up so we're going to move our two vertical lines over top of the solid two three now they're both solid we're going to get our cursor over top of them and we're going to do target management switch up once. So now he's locked. Uh, we dropped lock on the second guy. So we're going to see if we can't lock them both up at the same time. So target management switch up once on the second guy. Move over to the first guy, target management switch up once. 
And then if we do target management switch right once, we're going to cycle between the two two bandits. Uh, and then we last lock again. So again, keep doing the same thing. And as we do that, we see that our HUD symbologies have have changed. So looking at our MFD, because it's kind of hard to see the HSD right now, or the HUD rather, we see that our dynamic launch zone is up anytime we have a bandit locked up our HUD symbologies will change. So the open bracket here basically indicates, based on the carrot here, that's telling us how much energy our missile has. So right now our missile is just about, has enough energy to reach them. if he continues to fly straight at us. So the nice thing about the M120Cs is the missile will not go active until the missile is, you know, 10 miles or so from the target. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to unpause it and we're going to head, we're going to fly towards them and we're going to see that that dynamic launch zone change in real time. All right, so they're locking us up as well. So now that we have them locked up, looking at the HUD, we see that our missile has will have enough energy to reach the target, assuming he doesn't do a lot of crazy maneuvers. This carrot here represents the bandit. The 1090 is the closure rate, which is the airspeed of my aircraft and their aircraft combined. So that'll give us 1090 knots. The 14M indicates that our missile will go active at 14 miles. So when the missile is 14 miles from the target, from the bandit, is when the onboard radar inside the missile will start tracking the target by itself. So ideally, we are going to want to maintain our lock on that target until that missile goes active. So again, assuming that the bandit just flies straight at us and doesn't maneuver much, our missile has enough energy to reach the target. That's what the open bracket here indicates. So the top half is like the max, the absolute max range our missile can go. The bottom half, especially the closed off bracket here, indicates that our missile theoretically will have enough energy to hit the target if he does a lot of maneuvers it does not guarantee that it will hit the target. There are no guarantees for that. So it's kind of hard to see, but down here, down here, the solid piece, that is like our minimum, uh, our minimum engagement. So if the carrot is underneath here, there is not enough time for our missile, for the seeker head of our missile, to gain a lock onto that target. So more or less, our missile is just going to go stupid and it's it's not going to hit anything. So in that case, we would want to switch to our AIM-9X, which should allow us to fire a lot closer. So from our dynamic launch zone, if we continue down here to where it says A19, that means our missile, our missile is going to go active and 19 seconds. So if we were to fire right now, we are going to need to hold our lock on this target for 19 seconds to give our missile the best guidance to the target. I would highly suggest holding holding the lock. You don't necessarily have to because as soon as we break lock, that missile is going to try and maintain the memory on where the target is and it's going to go after him. So it doesn't guarantee it'll hit, doesn't guarantee that it'll see him, um, but that's what it's going to try and do. So looking at our right MFD here, let's say for instance, we had these two bandits and then say we had 
had a green from the aircraft in between both of them that were dogfighting, we would want to hold our shot because our missile, once that the onboard radar of our missile goes active, it doesn't care what it sees. It's just going to go after the very first thing that it sees. Say our friendly is on the six of one of these guys. We fire the missile. He shoots down that bandit, but he's at like the same altitude. There's a high probability chance that our missile is going to see the friendly and it's going to go after him. You kind of want to be smart about your engagements. In this case, I know that there's nothing else over there. It's all enemies. So we are good to fire. Looking at our left MFD, I'm going to go ahead and unpause it. And if we were to do target management switch left, we'll see that it says scan. And that scan running an IFF check on these two aircrafts. It, it's basically not just those two aircraft. It's anything that are that is within our radar screen. So it's scanning everything that it sees to indicate whether it's friendly or enemy. In our case, if it was friendly, it would flash green for a second. So in this case, before we locked them up, we seen that they are red, the red triangles. We know that they are enemies because our friendly AWACS that's further back here already ran the IFF scan on the two aircrafts. And they are essentially confirming with us that they are enemies. Let's go ahead and unpause it. And we are going to fire a Fox 3. So we've got them locked up. We're going to do hold our weapons release and that misses off. We got the second one off and then I'm going to fire one on the first guy again because I dropped black on accident. So now that we fired missiles, we can see some of the HUD symbologies, symbologies are changing. So because I've offset, our closure rate has decreased, which means that their missile is going to have to start tracking me. So it's going to have to start turning with me to track me, bleeding off energy for the missile, making it less of a threat. Granted, because I'm talking through everything, um, I would have fired on him a lot sooner because right now we are F011.6. That is how far away from the target I am. So that's how far away from the bandit I am. So 11 miles, that's not a place you want to be. But looking up, if we were to fire a missile right now, our missile will go active at nine, nine miles. The 11M, I believe that's for our first missile that we fired. That one will go active at 11 miles again, which A1 indicates that it's one second from missile active. We see that F011.6, so that's about accurate. Our missile is going to go active in one second, and that might be based on the last missile that I fired. So again, our foresight with the line, that is pointing to the enemy fighters, which they are 46 degrees off of our nose. So if I was to look this way, they're going to be somewhere over here, 46 degrees off my nose. We know that we know that the F-16 radar has a 60 degree field, field of view. So essentially, I can turn probably to 59 degrees is probably about as far as I'd want to go. And that would be considered putting the bandits on gimbal which gimbal is the maximum amount of movement our radar can make while maintaining um, lock. So that's more or less basically the dynamic launch zone. Uh, I will show you in a little bit the difference between the dynamic launch zone for air to air as well as air to ground stuff. And you'll see that the concept remains exactly the same. It's just instead of locking up a target with closure rates, and things like that. Otherwise, it's the concept is still the exact same. So let's go ahead and unpause it and see what happens with these missiles. So actually, real quick. Actually, real quick. So we'll see that we have the main square here, which is going to be our bandit. We see that there's a smaller square about the center of the other of both the bandits it's just kind of hard to see right now 
Those little squares indicates that the missiles are active and tracking those two targets. So it's basically what those little squares indicate. So as we watch that... Alright, so there's one hit. We got the other bandit here. And we got the second hit. So both of those are down. That's basically air-to-air -air stuff for you. We are equipped with our air-to-ground loadout. <laughs> it's early in the morning, so we're going to go ahead and turn our brightness up. Um, while we're flying out to our AO, let's go ahead and get set up for air-to-ground. So the very first thing that we'll notice when we get set up for air-to-ground, we'll select the air-to-ground master mode. We'll see that our two MFDs, with most of what we have selected, on our HSDs, uh, we'll see that they all change. So let's go to air to ground mode. And the very first thing that we notice is we've got our FC on our FCR page, we've got our uh, air to ground radar going. So it's actually a pretty good, pretty good radar. You don't want to fly straight on. You want to kind of keep it offset so that you can get a good, good look at everything. Uh, but the most impressive part about the air to ground radar is the GMT is a ground moving target. So if we're in search of a convoy, we could use our radar to search for any moving targets that are on the ground. Uh, the nice feature about this too is it works on helicopters as well. So you can actually pick up helicopters that are moving on the ground pretty, pretty good. So let's go ahead and pull back on the throttle. I don't have too much feel on the air to ground loadout. So now the first thing that I'll do is I'll actually get my MFD set up for what I'm doing with my air to ground loadout. So in this case we've got two AGM 88 cs as well as two 500 pound laser guided bombs. So on my left side, my left MFD, right next to the FCR page where it says FLCS, we'll actually double click on that and that'll bring up kind of a sub menu that has all of our other menus that we can select. So I'll actually pull up the HAD page which is going to be our harm our harm targeting pod mm -hmm. basically helps us see uh, enemy SAM sites and stuff. Any type of air to ground, um, air ground surface to air uh, radars. So with the left side set up, we'll look at the right side. By default, as soon as we get into the air to ground master mode, it's going to automatically select our SMS page. SMS page is going to be like our weapons storage overview. We'll see that we have two AG-88, which is AGM-88Cs, so those are our harms. Underneath that, we see it says power off, which means our harms are not turned on, so they're not looking at anything, they can't see anything, and they can't be fired. So let's go ahead and get this powered on by hitting the OSB adjacent to power off. By selecting that button, we see that they're now powered on. If we were to hit the button adjacent to AGM-88Cs, it'll cycle through the other air-to-ground ordnance that we have. In this case, it's two laser-guided bombs, so two GB-12s. So continuing with our right MFD, I prefer to drop my laser-guided bombs in CCRP. On the right MFD, we also have the HSD page. Again, it's almost necessary to have the HSD page. Um, I always have it up. Always check in surroundings. That way you don't get jumped by an enemy aircraft. Right next to that, we have our TGP, which is our targeting pod. If we do, so we'll see that neither of our MFDs are soy. They both say not soy, which means none of them are selected. If we make our targeting pod soy, and basically to indicate that it is soy, well, the easiest way to tell is our left MFD, which is not selected because there is no <coughs> white outline. It also says not soy. So we know that our left MFD is not selected. So if we look at our right MFD, let's go ahead and turn the brightness up. So we see that there is the white outline of our MFD which indicates that this MFD is soy, and it is selected. So, if we were to, if we were to, using our radar cursor switch, let's go ahead and get our helmet mounted display up. If we were to move our radar cursor switch, 
we'll see that we can move the targeting pod. So right now it's looking at our at our external storage on our aircraft. So we can increase the field of view on our targeting pod, which right now it is wide because we see the outline box. If we were to press our expand field of view, this outline will go away and this here is what we'll be looking at. So we can either hit the wide OSB or we can hit the expand field of view on our HOTAS which will also do the same thing. And then also on our HOTAS, if we were to select our manual range CW, that'll also zoom in based on our nine times zoom. So the 9Z, 3Z, 0Z. And then we can also zoom in as well, which allows us to see even finer details. Now, if we were to do target management switch left, that'll cycle through our TV mode to our white hot to black hot, and then once again to TV mode. And then you can fine tune it with the contrast. So if the brightness is a little bit too bright, you can adjust the contrast. Generally speaking, I'll cycle between white hot and black hot. So as we're kind of loitering around here, looking at our DED page, we see that STPT is our steer point. We see that steer point one is selected. If we were to press our rocker switch up or down, that will change from steer point one to steer point two if we were to hit up and then down it would go from steer point one to 99 in this case or uh well 699 actually um or if we we're at two or three steer point two or three it would go down to two and then one so kind of self-explanatory there so now that we've kind of gone over the controls a little bit for that if we were to do display management switch right That'll cycle through our right MFD pages that we have selected here. So it'll go from the HSD page to the targeting pod to the SMS page. So again, display management switch right, TGP, again to the SMS page, back to the HSD. And it's the same thing on the left side. It's just the right goes from left to right left goes from left to right. So from the HAD page to the FCR to test to HAD to FCR. So it's helpful to quickly, quickly cycle through. If your nose is buried in the targeting pod, you can quickly hit display management switch right twice. And that'll cycle to the HSD page. Okay, there are no enemy aircrafts nearby. We can go back to the targeting pod. So it's just a nice tool to make sure that you stay alive, basically. So let's go ahead and select the targeting pod. And you can also cycle through them and not have any of them soy as well. So you don't need to make one of them soy to cycle through. So let's go ahead and make our HAD page soy. So our left MFD. We're going to use our harm targeting pod to lock up to lock up a SAM site to eliminate that. In order to do that, we're going to need to go back and select our AGM 88Cs. We're going to hit the button adjacent to our laser added bombs. Now we're back to two AGM 88Cs. Let's go back to the HSD page. We see that our steer point is coming up. We see that there is an <laughs> SA6 and an SA2. So we're going to pull up our targeting pod because once we select the once we select the SAM sites with our targeting pod, assuming that we have a good reading on the SAM site, our targeting pod will also look in that direction as well. So looking at the top side of our left MFD, we see that it says PGM5. That indicates that our harm targeting pod does not have a very good 
location on the SAM site. So we're going to want to offset our aircraft and fly kind of per perpendicular to the radars so that we can kind of narrow down this search. So in this case, we want to take out the SA-2, the which is a track radar for the SA-2 site. So when we see that the SA-2 on our RWR actually has us locked based on the search radar here, which is the S. So the search radar sees us. The tracking radar, which will give us our beeping noise for our RWR, does not see us yet. So we see that we went from PGM-5 to now PGM-3. So I would imagine a couple more seconds and we'll be at a PGM-2. So, and just like the air-to-air -air engagements, we are gonna wanna use our radar cursor switch to get the two horizontal lines over top of our radar. So in this case, the SA-2 or the two. We see that it is now a PGM-2. So with our radar cursor over top of the two, we can go ahead and do target management switch up. We see that it is now a red box highlighting the two with a white outline. As soon as we lock up the target, we see that our dynamic launch zone changed. Before we locked up the target, we just had a horizontal box. Now that we've locked up the target, we've got a long vertical line, which is basically our bomb fall line. We've got our steering cue that will essentially want to have in the center of our bomb fall line. That way the missile doesn't have to burn extra energy to get to the target by having to turn. These two horizontal lines here and then here is our loft indication. So basically we'll want our steering cue not only centered with our bomb fall line, we'll also want it somewhere in between these two lines to help loft our AGM 88Cs to give it its maximum range. Looking at our right side, we've got our dynamic launch zone. So at maximum, it's 80 miles. I don't know if an AGM 88C can go 80 miles. That's just whenever our carrot starts to kind of descend. But it's the same sort of feature. Like the top half up here is going to be your maximum range. Um, I probably wouldn't fire if it's anywhere in between these two brackets here. I would wait until it's underneath. And then from underneath, we can essentially fire off our harm. And our harm will have enough distance to reach the target. Because unlike air-to-air -air aircrafts, they're not going to essentially maneuver like an enemy fighter will. They just they just can't do it. So again, this is our carrot indicating at which point uh, the missile's energy is going to have. So basically the, the energy state of the missile. The B036.7, that's going to be the distance to the radar that we have locked up. But we're going to go ahead and unpause it. And then we're going to turn in. And we are going to fire off our harm. So from here, it's going to be the exact same. There's our uh, steering cue. I know it's really hard to see because of the uh, because of the seeking sun. But we know it's basically lined up. We're within range, and we are going to hold uh, weapons release. And there goes our harm. And then we're going to offset us, offset ourselves, so that the CM can't really launch on us. If we go back to the targeting pod and lock it up again, see how our targeting pod kind of, kind of points to that direction? Which is going to be right there somewhere. I actually think it's going to be a little bit closer. I think that there's the SA-2 site. So assuming it doesn't shut the radar off, 
That big one right there is going to be the search radar. And that one there is going to be the track radar. So we're just going to... Alright, so we're within launch range of it. It can fire on us. We're going to push out the other way. And we're going to hope it doesn't shut off the radar. If it shuts off the radar, our arm's going to be able to reach. Alright, I might have been incorrect. That one might have been the uh, track radar. And this one here might have been the search radar. By using our targeting pod, we see that our missile hit. It also damaged a couple other aircrafts, or a couple other vehicles. We see the missiles there. And they have not fired on us yet. We see on our RWR, the SA-2 is no longer tracking us. So it looks like it was a good hit. And now we're going to repeat the process. So if we do expand field of view, we'll also zoom in on the HAD page. So it'll give us a little bit more... It would be able to kind of fine-tune what we were launching on. So let's go ahead and get that SA-6 locked up. Repeat the process. Get it, get it in between the cursors. Lock it up. And it's the same, same thing. There's our weapons release. There goes our harm up there. It's trying to reach a better air density. Now it's dropping on the target. And if we do the same thing, our targeting pod is trying to look at it. Oh, there it is. All right, our SA-6 site only has a tracking radar. So I know for a fact that's the uh, radar that we want to watch. And we're going to watch that missile impact. There it goes. So we've gone through the process of firing AGM-88Cs. If we go back into our SMS page, we see that both of our AGM-88Cs are no longer there. If we hit the button adjacent to AGM-88Cs, that'll bring up our two laser-guided bombs. So the first thing we're going to want to do is make sure our laser is armed by right-clicking this switch here. And then I've got a couple of transport vehicles down here at Damascus, which we are currently flying over, and we will see if we can find them. Uh, which, there they are. So now we're gonna wanna offset ourselves because we're actually right over the target. Looking at our fuel gauge, the F-16 is at 6,400 pounds of fuel total. I know the max internal fuel capacity is 7,200 pounds. So I know our single external fuel tank is empty. To verify that, this switch here is actually what we can change to see how much fuel is inside our aircraft. So RSVR is our reserve. We see that there's about 500 pounds in there. And the only thing that's going to change is a gauge. This here is how much fuel we have total, 6,400 pounds. If we right click again, this is internal wings. And it looks like we don't have a whole lot, maybe 150 pounds there. If we have external fuel tanks, which we don't. External fuel tanks are empty, but that would tell us our external fuel tanks. EXT CTR is going to be our external, our center bag external fuel tank, which is basically this guy right here. So we know that it's empty because our fuel gauge is telling us it's empty. We can actually go ahead and drop that real quick by going into the SMS page. We can go to the SJ page, which is selective jettison. 
we know that TK300 is going to be our external fuel tank. So if we hit the button adjacent to that, which is going to be this one here in the center, it's going to highlight that center fuel tank for us. And then if we hold pickle release or weapons release button, we'll see that that'll drop the fuel tank. It'll go from one to zero. And now that external fuel tank is gone. Uh, the center bag fuel tank is probably a good one to drop as it creates a lot of drag on the aircraft. If we look at the targeting pod, we see that it says area. Area indicates the type of lock that we have. The targeting pod is looking at that general area, and it's better if you're maneuvering the aircraft because the targeting pod is going to stay in that one area. Whereas if we do target management switch up, that kind of creates a lock and it gives our bombs coordinates on where it wants to drop. So if we do target management switch up once, that'll go from an area area track to a point track. We'll also see that at the cross here we now have this box that indicates our exact location that it's looking at and that's going to send coordinates to in this case our laser guided bombs. So now that we're flying on target we are going to drop our bombs on that target. We're going to go ahead and keep it in a point track. If we had to maneuver at all we would want to hit target management switch down once to turn it to an area track. So again we're going to do target management switch up once to make it a point as we are getting closer so because we're dropping a laser guided bomb it doesn't really have a whole lot of inertia except for the airspeed and altitude of our aircraft that's the only inertia it's going to get we see our carrot here will not start dropping until we're under 10 miles from the target so it's getting this information from our targeting pod wherever that is looking at so as we get closer we want to keep our steering cue with our vertical bomb drop line which is this vertical line we want to essentially keep that in the center that way the bomb just kind of falls straight and it's not trying to turn to hit the target because it, it just doesn't have the energy to do that. As we get closer, as our carrot gets closer to our drop zone, we'll see a slightly bigger circle up here. That circle, as we get even closer, will start to flash. Once it starts to flash, we want to hold the pickle release button. As we're holding the pickle release button, we will have a small horizontal line show up and start to descend. As soon as, as, soon as that horizontal horizontal, smaller horizontal line reaches our steering cue, the bomb will drop automatically for us, at which point our time will update on our targeting pod down here on the bottom right. Our time will update based on impact for that bomb. So let's go ahead and unpause it. We're going to wait for that big circle to show up and then we're going to hold weapons release. So there's that big circle. Once it starts flashing, it's flashing. Make sure your master arm is on. There's that smaller horizontal line. We're going to hold weapons release. Bombs away. So now that time is 40 seconds. So we're going to fly over the aircraft. We're going to give it, give it a little bit of laser so that our bomb can kind of see where it's looking. It'll start to point. Once we get to about 10 seconds, so we're going to go ahead and offset to the right a little bit. That way our targeting pod can maintain visual. Actually, we're going to go to the left here. So we're at 10 seconds. We're going to go ahead and turn our laser on. We see that the laser is flashing on our HUD, as well as on our targeting pod on the right. Weapon impact in one second. Boom. Now that our bomb impacted, we can go ahead and let go of the laser. The laser does have an automatic feature as well where it where it'll automatically laze for us. And that's why it's still going off right now. So that was one aircraft taken care of. We're going to go ahead and zoom out a little bit. We see that there's another one here. Uh, and we're going to repeat the process. So our screen just went black because our targeting pod is look looking behind us and I can't see back there so uh we want to make sure that we we want to make sure that we put the targeting pod as soon as we're able to back into area track that way the targeting pod is looking roughly in the same area all right we're going to do the same thing we're 12 miles out so we're going to go ahead and quickly quickly roll in we know that the targeting pod was not very far off so it won't take us long to get that lined up either so we're 13 miles from the target We see our targeting pod is, has a pretty good, pretty good view of the area. 
We're gonna get lined up with our bomb fall line. Our aircraft, because I have autopilot on, is climbing. It wants to get us back up to that altitude. So we are now 10 miles. We see that our weapons release carrot is descending. I'm going to hit the trim button because our weight is off. I'm going to go ahead and do target management switch up once on our targeting pod. So we've got the point track set for it. We gotta wait for that big circle to show up. There it is. Now it's flashing, so we're gonna go ahead and hold weapons release. And there goes that bomb. We see that the the uh, timed impact has updated. That master caution came on because we went from Cat 3 to now Cat 1. It essentially limits how many Gs the aircraft can pull uh, to prevent the wings from getting ripped off with weight underneath them. So external fuel tanks, bombs, and stuff like that. All right, we're within 10 seconds. So we're going to go ahead and designate, designate our TGP, turn our laser on, go ahead and offset. And there's a weapon explosion. Watching that explosion is probably my favorite thing. Just to see the, the little bomb kind of come into, come into view and then the massive explosion. On a side note, I think I'm going to try and stream a little bit more. Uh, if you happen to want to stop by and check it out, if you're new to DCS and it's something that you're interested in and you want to learn, uh, do feel free to stop by and uh, chat with me. Uh, unfortunately, due to my work schedule, I've got very limited free time and I would only be able to stream Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So I don't know how much of it I'll be doing, uh, but if, if, if you find that the video is helpful and you want to stop by and, you know, just say hi, or if you have any questions on specifically the F-16 Viper, uh, I'd be more than happy to chat with you and help you out with any any type of issues or any questions you may have. Uh, my Twitch is going to be twitch.tv slash I am Scarn. Thank you for taking time out of your day to check out the video. I hope you were able to find it informative and you're able to get take some knowledge from it. Uh, until the next time, take care.